The expectation is not of a rate cut, but some in the market are expecting a shift in stance, which may or may not come. But a dovish tilt is what some of our panelists here were talking about. Although some, like Indranil, believe the tone may be absolutely even, no giving away when the policy may pivot. Watch out for the growth forecast as well at 7.2% at the moment. Half the respondents to our poll said it could be revised downwards, but even at about 7% or so, uh, you know, it's not a bad GDP number we're looking at. As far as inflation is concerned, there could be some tinkering in the quarterly forecast, uh, given that in the second quarter, inflation has undershot what RBI was expecting. And, you know, in the coming months, it is expected, you know, as the base effect wears off Seasons to come in around 5% or so. We have the governor. Take a look. This is the 51st meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee, that is the MPC. And this is how it goes. The flexible inflation targeting framework has completed eight years since its introduction in 2016. This is a major structural reforms of 21st century India. It stands out for its committee approach to decision making, transparency of policy making process and communication, accountability hinging upon quantitatively defined inflation target and operational independence. Over the years, the framework has matured across various interest rate cycles and monetary policy stances. When I look back, I can say with confidence that the flexible inflation targeting has served us well over the years and has proved its mettle. It brought about an era of price stability in the pre-COVID-19 period, with inflation averaging around the target rate of 4%. Thereafter, despite continuing global turmoil from multiple sources in the last four years or so, the flexibility embedded in the flexible inflation targeting framework has helped us to effectively address these unprecedented challenges while supporting growth. Monetary policy in India was able to respond to the economic slowdown decisively and swiftly in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and again preemptively during the buildup of inflationary pressures after the war began in Ukraine in early 2022. The prevailing well-balanced growth inflation dynamics is indeed a testimony to the success of this monetary policy framework. Let me now turn to the decisions and deliberations of the Monetary Policy Committee. The Monetary Policy Committee met on, and this time, as you would be aware, this time we have three new external members in the MPC. The Monetary Policy Committee with three new external members met on 7th, 8th, and 9th October and after assessing the evolving macroeconomic and financial conditions and the outlook, the MPC decided by a majority of five out of six members to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. Consequently, the standing deposit facility, that is the SDF rate, remains at 6.25%, and the marginal standing facility, that is the MSF rate and the bank rate, they stand at 6.75%. Further, the MPC decided unanimously to change the stance, that is the stance of the monetary policy, to neutral and, to, and also decided to, uh, let me read it again, the MPC decided unanimously to change the stance to neutral and to remain unambiguously focused on a durable alignment of inflation with the target while supporting growth. The MPC noted that currently the macroeconomic parameters of inflation and growth are well balanced. Headline inflation is on a downward trajectory, though its pace has been slow and uneven. Going forward, the moderation in headline inflation is expected to reverse in September and likely to remain elevated in the near term due to adverse base effects, among other factors. Food inflation pressures could see some easing later in the financial year on the back of strong kharif sowing, adequate buffer stocks, and good soil moisture conditions, which are conducive for 
rabi sowing. Adverse weather events continue to pose contingent risks to food inflation. Core inflation, on the other hand, appears to have bottomed out. Fuel component of the CPI remains in contraction. Despite, uh, sorry, domestic growth has sustained its momentum with private consumption and investment growing in tandem. Resilient growth gives us the space to focus on inflation so as to enable its durable descent to the 4% target. In these circumstances, the MPC decided to remain watchful of the evolving outlook in the coming months. Keeping in view the prevailing inflation and growth conditions and the outlook, the MPC considered it appropriate to change the stance to neutral and to remain and to remain, I repeat, and to remain unambiguously focused on a durable alignment of inflation with the target while, of course, supporting growth. I would now turn to an assessment of the growth and inflation situation. First, let me uh, talk in brief about the global growth conditions. The global economy has remained resilient since the last meeting of the MPC in August. Although downside risks from increasingly intense geopolitical conflicts, geoeconomic fragmentation, financial market volatility, and elevated public debt continue to play out. Manufacturing is showing signs of slowdown while services activity is holding up. World trade is exhibiting improvement. Inflation is softening, supported by lower energy prices. Growing divergence in inflation growth dynamics across countries has resulted in varying monetary policy responses. Let me now turn to domestic growth. Real GDP grew by 6.7% in the first quarter of this financial year, that is 24-25. And this was led by a revival in private consumption and improvement in investment. The share of investment in GDP reached its highest level since 2012-13. Government expenditure, on the other hand, contracted during the first quarter. On the supply side, gross value added, that is GVA, expanded by 6.8%, surpassing the GDP growth, aided by strong industrial and services sector activities. <coughs> High frequency indicators available so far suggest that domestic economic activity continues to be steady. The main components from the supply side, that is agriculture, manufacturing, and services, they remain resilient. Agricultural growth has been supported by above normal southwest monsoon rainfall and better kharif sowing. Higher reservoir levels with good moisture conditions of soil augur well for the ensuing rabi crop. Manufacturing activity is gaining on the back of improving domestic demand, lower input costs, and supportive government policy, supportive policy environment from the government. Eight core industries output fell by 1.8% in August on a high base. Excess rainfall also dampened the production in certain sectors such as electricity, coal, and cement in August. The Purchasing Managers Index, that is PMI for manufacturing, at 56.5 for September remained elevated. The services sector continues to grow at a strong pace. PMI services at 57.7 in September indicates robust expansion. On the demand side, Rural demand is trending upwards while urban demand continues to hold firm. Government consumption is improving. Investment activity remains buoyant with government capex rebounding from a contraction observed in the first quarter of this year. Private investment also continues to gain steam on the back of expansion from expansion in non-food bank credit. Higher capacity utilization and rising investment intentions. On the external front, services exports is supporting overall growth. Looking ahead, 
India's growth story remains intact as its fundamental drivers, namely consumption and investment demand, are gaining momentum. Prospects of private consumption, the mainstay of aggregate demand, look bright on the back of improved agricultural outlook and rural demand. Sustained buoyancy in services would also support urban demand. Government expenditure of the center and the states is expected to pick up pace in line with the budget estimates. Investment activity would benefit from consumer and business optimism. Governments continued thrust on capex and healthy balance sheets of banks and corporates. Taking all these factors into consideration, taking all these factors into consideration, real GDP growth for 24-25 is projected at 7.2%. With Q2 at 7%, Q3 at 7.4%, and Q4 7.4%. Real GDP growth for Q1 of next financial year, that is 25-26, is projected at 7.3%. The risks are evenly balanced. I would now like to turn to inflation. Now, as anticipated, headline inflation softened significantly in July and August, with base effect playing a major role in the month of July. Food inflation experienced a certain degree of correction during these two months. Considerable divergence, however, was observed within the food subgroups. Now, whatever I am saying, I have given a lot of data in the footnote of my statement, which, as usual, will be uploaded in the RBI website immediately after my statement is, uh, immediately after I complete my statement. For example, I just now said, that uh, considerable divergence, however, was observed within the food subgroups. So this is backed up by the data which I have given in the footnotes. And in fact, all the statements that I am making are backed up by supportive data there in the footnotes. So those of you who are interested may like to have a look at them after it is uploaded. Now, deflation in fuel group depend on softening electricity and LPG prices. Core inflation, on the other hand, edged up in July and August. The CPI print for the month of September is expected to see a big jump due to unfavorable base effects and pick up in food price momentum. And this, is, this would be caused by the lingering effects of a shortfall in production of onion, potato, and chana dal, that is gram, in 2023-24, among other factors. The headline inflation trajectory, however, is projected to sequentially moderate in Q4 of the current financial year due to good curry harvest, ample buffer stocks of cereals, and a likely good crop in the ensuing rabi season. Unexpected weather events and worsening geopolitical conflicts continue as major upside risks to inflation. International crude prices have become volatile in the month of October, that is in the current month. The recent uptick in food and metal prices, and this is very important, the recent uptick in food and metal prices as seen in the FAO, that is Food and Agricultural Organization, and the World Bank price indices for September, if sustained, can add to the upside risks to CPI inflation. Taking into account all these factors, CPI inflation for 2024-25, that is for the current year, is projected at 4.5%, with Q2 at 4.1%, Q3 at 4.8%, and Q4 at 4.2%. CPI inflation for the first quarter, that is Q1 of next financial year, that is 2025-26, is projected at 4.3%. The risks are evenly balanced. <clears throat> now, I have, you know, I have summarized uh, our assessment of uh, the domestic growth and the inflation conditions and the outlook as per our assessment. 
Now, what do these, this raises the question, what do these inflation and growth conditions mean for monetary policy? The development since the last meeting of MPC in August indicate further progress towards realizing a durable disinflation towards the target. Despite the near-term upsides to inflation from food prices, the evolving domestic price situation signals moderation in headline inflation thereafter. The agricultural crop outlook is turning out to be favorable with improving prospects of Kharif and Rabi output. These factors could lead to an easing of food inflation pressures, but this optimism is subject to weather-related shocks, if any. Core inflation is right, likely to remain broadly contained on continuing transmission of past monetary policy actions, unless, of course, there are surprises in global commodity prices. The prevailing and expected inflation growth balance, please mark my words, the prevailing and the expected inflation growth balance have created congenial conditions for a change in monetary policy stance to neutral. Even as there is greater confidence in navigating the last mile of, dis uh, last mile of disinflation, significant risks, I repeat, significant risks to inflation from adverse weather events, accentuating geopolitical conflicts, and the very recent increase in certain commodity prices continue to stare at us. The adverse impact of these risks cannot be undermined, cannot be underestimated. It's with a lot of effort that inflation, it's with a lot of effort that the inflation horse has been brought to the stable, that is closer to the target within the tolerance band compared to its highest or heightened levels two years ago. We have to be very careful about opening the gate as the horse may simply bolt again. We must keep the horse, we must keep the horse in tight leash so, as to, so that we do not lose control. Going forward, we need to closely monitor the evolving conditions for further confirmation of the disinflationary impulses. I would now like to turn to the liquidity and financial market conditions. System liquidity remained in surplus during August and September and also in early October, with a pickup in government spending and decline in currency in circulation. Liquidity conditions, however, had turned into deficit for a brief period during the latter half of September with the buildup of government cash balances on account of tax-related outflows. In sync with the sh shifting liquidity conditions, the Reserve Bank proactively conducted two-way operations to ensure alignment of interbank overnight rate with the policy repo rate. Across the term money market segments, the yields on three-month treasury bills, that is T-bills, and commercial papers issued by non-banking financial companies, that is NBFCs, eased, while that on certificates of deposits firmed up marginally. The 10-year GSEC yield softened in August-September on global and domestic queues, including policy pivot in the United States and also in some major economies. Impro and also, these are not the only factors, but uh, the yields in August-September, I'm talking about the 10-year GSEC yields, they softened somewhat in August and September due to multiple factors, which would include Pivot in, US, you know, pivot in the monetary policy of uh, the U.S. and some major economies, improved global investor sentiment, benign domestic inflation, and accelerated fiscal consolidation. The term premium, that is 10-year GSEC yield minus three-month T-bills yield, has remained stable in the last, in the recent uh, few months. Transmission to the credit market has been satisfactory. Moving forward, the Reserve Bank will continue to be nimble and flexible in its liquidity management operations. We will deploy an appropriate mix of instruments to modulate both frictional and durable liquidity so as to ensure that money market interest rates 
evolve in an orderly manner. During the current financial year, that is up to 8th of October, that is uh, till uh, yesterday, the exchange rate of the Indian rupee has remained largely range bound. The Indian rupee also continued to be the least volatile among peer EME currencies. This was so even during the high volatile episode following the unwinding of the yen carry trade in early August this year. The lower volatility of the Indian rupee reflects India's strong macroeconomic fundamentals and improved external sector outlook. I would now turn to financial stability. The health parameters of banks and NBFCs in India continue to be strong. There has been some recent commentary on the likelihood of stress buildup in a few unsecured loan segments like loans for consumption purposes, microfinance loans and credit card outstandings. The Reserve Bank is closely monitoring the incoming information and will take measures as may be considered necessary. Banks and NBFCs on their part need to carefully assess their individual exposures in these areas, both in terms of size and quality. Their underwriting standards and post-sanction monitoring have to be robust. Continued attention also needs to be given to potential risks from inoperative deposit accounts, cybersecurity landscape, mule accounts, and a few other factors which we have been uh, stressing and highlighting time and again in the public domain as well as in our interaction with the banks and NBFCs. Now, overall, I would again like to stress that our banking and the NBFC sector, that is the financial sector, remains healthy, resilient, and stable. NBFCs in particular have registered an impressive growth over the last few years. This has resulted in more credit flow to remote and underserved segments, bolstering financial inclusion. While the overall NBFC sector remains healthy, let me re-emphasize, while the overall NBFC sector remains healthy, I have a few messages to certain outliers. First, it is observed that some NBFCs are aggressively pursuing growth without building up sustainable business practices and risk management frameworks, which should be commensurate with the scale and complexity of their portfolio. An imprudent, an imprudent growth at any cost approach would be counterproductive for their own health. Second, driven by significant accretion to their capital from both domestic and overseas sources, and sometimes under pressure from their investors, some NBFCs, including microfinance institutions and housing finance companies, are chasing excessive returns on their equity. While such pursuits are in the domain of the boards and managements of NBFCs, concerns arise when interest rates charged by them become usurious and get combined with unreasonably high processing fees and frivolous penalties. These practices are sometimes further accentuated by what appears to be a push effect as business targets drive retail credit growth rather than its actual demand. I'm not generalizing it for the whole NBFC sector. There are certain NBFCs where it is happening. Bilaterally, we are engaged with them, but I think this is a, major, this is a message which uh, it's important not only for these outliers to keep in mind, but I think this should act as a guidance for the entire sector. Now, the consequent high cost, when I'm, that is, I was talking about the push effect, that is, business targets driving retail growth rather than its actual demand. In that context, I would like to say that the consequent high cost and high indebtedness could pose financial stability risks if not addressed by these NBFCs in time. Third, NBFCs may review their prevailing compensation practices, variable pay, and incentive structures, some of which appear to be pure, purely target-driven in certain NBFCs. Such practices may result in adverse work culture and poor customer service. To sum up, 
It is important that NBFCs, including MFIs and housing finance companies, follow sustainable business goals, a compliance-first culture, a strong risk management framework, a strict adherence to fair practices code, and a sincere approach to customer grievances. The Reserve Bank is closely monitoring these areas and will not hesitate to take appropriate action, action if necessary. Self-correction by NBFCs would, however, be the desired option. Coming to external sector, India's current account deficit, that is CAD, widened to 1.1% of GDP in the first quarter of this financial year, that is 24-25, and this was on account of higher trade deficit. Buoyancy in services exports and strong remittance receipts are expected to keep the current account deficit within the sustainable level. On the external financing side, foreign portfolio investment, that is FPI flows, have seen a turnaround from the net outflows of 4.2 billion US dollars in April and May this year. They have turned from net outflows. In April and May, we had net outflow of 4.2 billion US dollars. Now they have now turned to net inflows of 19.2 billion US dollars during June to October, and this is the figure till 7th of October. Foreign direct investment, that is FDI flows, remain strong in 24-25, as both gross and net FDI flows have improved in April and July. While external commercial borrowings moderated, non-resident deposits recorded higher net inflows compared to last year. India's foreign exchange reserves have already crossed a new milestone of US dollar 700 billion. Overall, India's external sector remains resilient as key external sector vulnerability indicators continue to improve. And when I say key external sector vulnerabilities continue to improve, I have backed it up by the data in the footnote of the statement. On the whole, we remain confident of meeting our external financing requirements comfortably. I shall now announce certain additional measures. The first relates to respond, responsible lending conduct, levy of foreclosure charges, and or prepayment penalties on loans. The Reserve Bank has taken several measures over the years to safeguard consumer interest. As part of these measures, banks and NBFCs are not permitted to levy foreclosure charges or pre-penalty prepayment penalties on any floating rate term loan sanctioned to individual borrowers for non-business purposes. That is for purposes other than business. It is now proposed to broaden the scope of these guidelines to include loans to micro and small enterprises. Micro and small enterprises, that is MSEs. A draft circular in this regard shall be issued for public consultation. The second announcement relates to discussion paper on capital raising avenues for primary urban cooperative banks, that is for UCBs. The Reserve Bank has undertaken several initiatives in recent years to strengthen the UCB sector. Such initiatives include issuance of regulatory guidelines in 2022 for issue and regulation of share capital and securities by the urban cooperative banks. To provide more flexibility and avenues to the UCBs, that is urban cooperative banks, to raise capital, a discussion paper on capital raising avenues for UCBs will be issued for feedback and suggestions from stakeholders. The third announcement relates to creation of Reserve Bank Climate Risk Information System. Climate change is emerging as a significant risk to financial system world over. This makes it necessary for regulated entities to undertake robust climate risk assessment which is sometimes hindered by gaps in high-quality climate-related data. To bridge, this, to bridge these uh, data gaps, the Reserve Bank proposes to create a data repository, namely the Reserve Bank Climate Risk Information System, or in short, RBI. 
CRIS, Reserve Bank Climate Risk Information System, that is RB CRIS. The next announcement relates to UPI, where we are enhancing certain limits for the various transactions. UPI has transformed India's financial landscape by making digital payments accessible and inclusive through continuous innovation and adaptation. To further encourage wider adoption of UPI and make it more inclusive, it has been decided first to enhance the, pre, the per transaction limit. To enhance the per transaction limit in UPI 1, 2, 3 pay from rupees 5,000 to rupees 10,000. And second, it has also been decided to increase the UPI light wallet limit from rupees 2,000 to rupees 5,000 and per transaction limit from rupees 500 to rupees 100. The final announcement relates to introduction of beneficiary account name lookup facility. Let me explain what it means. At present, UPI and immediate payment service, that is IMPS, provide a facility for the remitter of funds to verify the name of the receiver of the funds, that is the beneficiary, before executing a payment transaction. It is now proposed to introduce such a facility for RTGS as well as the NEFT systems. This facility will enable the remitter to verify the name of the account holder before effecting funds transfer to him or her through RTGS or NEFT. This facility will also have the effect of reducing the possibility of wrong credits and frauds. Let me now conclude. Today, the Indian economy presents a picture of stability and strength. The balance between inflation and growth is well poised. India's growth story remains intact. Inflation is on a declining path, although we still have a distance to cover. The external sector demonstrate, demonstrates the strength of the economy. Forex reserves are scaling new peaks. Fiscal consolidation is underway. The financial sector remains sound and resilient. Global investor optimism in India's prospects is perhaps at its highest ever. We are, however, not complacent. I repeat, we are not complacent, especially amidst the rapidly evolving global conditions. The monetary policy action today reflects the MPC's assessment that at the current juncture, it would be appropriate to have greater flexibility and optionality to act in sync, to act in sync with the evolving conditions and the outlook. We stand unambiguously committed to ensure durable alignment of inflation with the target while supporting growth. In the prevailing macroeconomic conditions and the outlook, Mahatma Gandhi's rem words remain highly relevant. And I quote, when the method is good, success is bound to come in the end. Thank you. Namaskar. All right. So that was the Reserve Bank of India, Governor. No